Hello and thank you for purchasing the Mr. Manhole Tools. I'm Mike Kreitz, president of the company, and the purpose of this DVD is to familiarize you with the tools, how to unpack, assemble, care for the tools, and how to perform an efficient quality repair that will last for years. You've removed the lid from your container. You've obviously found the documentation package. You're watching the video that was in the documentation package. We're going to remove all of the items that are on the top all the way down to the cardboard protection ring. To lift from the box, we're going to use a short strap, as you see. We're going to attach it by pulling the safety pin, pulling the main pin, putting it back through the strap, and then we'll loop those over a lifting device. We'll lift the cutter extractor straight up. back away from the box. Okay, you want to remove the legs and you want to loosen and remove the bolts that hold the leg top and bottom together and extend the leg fully and replace the bolt. Do that for each of the four legs. You want to attach the four legs to the machine by sliding the, mach the leg up, pulling the T-lock, and aligning this locator bolt with this slot. And let the T snap back in, locking the leg on. You'll want to set the machine down on its legs before doing anything else for safety reasons. Do not disconnect the lift strap during this operation. Set the machine down on its legs, leave the strap hooked up for safety reasons. You'll want to remove the main guide shaft from the container. It will have a bolt on one end It'll have a locating pin on the other end. You want to remove the bolt. You want to take a look at the uh, guide pin on the other end and make sure that the set screw is tight. And you're ready to install the shaft. You will slide the guide shaft up into the main receiver and insert the bolt and securely tighten it. Okay, you'll want to lift the cutter extractor and shorten the legs by removing the bolts and the legs and sliding the legs up to the bottom hole.
you'll want to pull each of the arms out and invert it or ship upside down so you'll remove the arm and the blade turn it over and slide it back in remember to select the right cutting diameter for the job you're doing make them all the same there's a hardware package that was shipped with your cutter extractor you'll take those bolts and reinsert those down through the arm and tighten they have nylock nuts remember to use the washers and the nylock nuts the washers go on the top and the bottom and a nylock nut goes on the bottom make sure you use both bolts two bolts in each arm and securely tighten them the arms are not totally tight they'll move just a little bit by design if you choose to put the extended guide shaft on you'll want to make sure that you have your legs extended fully or the guide shaft will contact the ground the serial number for the six shooter is always going to be located where you see it back inside protected from damage if you need to refer to that number when calling in to support you'll find it there after removing the six shooter and assembling it the items that you see are what's left in the container the speed plate that you've chosen with your machine either the California speed plate or the standard speed plate will be partially disassembled and in the box we're going to show you how to assemble that you have the material starter pack part of that that's still there and uh, the marking device and some extra teeth some accessory items and uh, we'll pull those out and show you how to use each of those this is the casting lifter that was in your package initially the items that you took out to remove the six shooter this is used for locking into the frame and setting it back on after the repair anytime you move a frame you need to use this it's a safe way to lift it ships with the short tabs that you see here if you've received a standard speed plate these will probably be what you'll want on there that's why they're pre-installed if you've got a California speed plate you may need the longer tabs those are also shipped in the package if you find that you need those you have them make sure that you keep them somewhere where you can access them later if you need them the casting lifter has an attachment point this would be used for the optional lid lifting magnet if you choose to go that route uh, the device is great for lifting heavy lids the magnet attaches to this you lock it onto the lid and then two men can safely lift the lid it does not ship with this package but you can order it through our office this is the debris containment system that you removed from your package earlier it will be used around the cutter while you're cutting to contain the debris it has a clip that when you wrap it you can clip the two ends together included in your package were the four underslung fixtures these are used to reduce the cutting diameter of the cutter there are only four that's as many as you want to use for a reduced diameter cut in your package you have the easy slope device it's a three-part system the use of it is explained later in the training there's also four markers you want to make sure that you keep one of these as a sample you'll have to buy more and uh, we'll give you sources of where to buy those but you need that specific marker to work with the easy slope device the balance of the items that were in your box are our starter package that we give you the materials and a few small tools I'll point out each item this is the bentonite strip this is the 30 inch liner there's also a piece of the 27 inch liner there's a couple pieces of the epoxy coated reinforcing along with the ties that we use to wrap around those and secure those together there's also the tie tool the installation tool for the ties there's the measuring calipers for the frame 
There's a bag of black dye. And then there's the Mr. Manhole sealants, two tubes of that. And the sealant for the interface between the asphalt and the new repair. Those are the items of material and tools that you'll use to do the rebuild. That will be explained in a later chapter. There are two speed plate designs in the Mr. Manhole system. The standard and the California speed plate. The California speed plate is used in manhole frames where there is no lid undercut. It's a smooth walled frame from top to bottom. Consequently, there's no place for the speed plate to lock under the lid undercut, so the California speed plate works by a different principle that allows it to tighten laterally as it's picked up. After you make your cut and you pull up on the frame, it generates lateral tightening pressure against the hardened studs in the face of that unit, pushes out against the smooth walls, locks in, and pulls the frame from the road. You see a traditional manhole frame with the lid undercut, and then you see the difference with the smooth walled. All right, the standard speed plate will be shipped as seen, disassembled. You'll first want to put the wheel onto the threaded rod, nut facing out. You will slide the large fork end into the slots, bring that all the way in. and latch the little hook into the slots provided in the wheel. You'll take your skinny fork in and slide it into those slots. Noticing there are various adjustments on here to get your center point in the center of your frame. Then you'll simply stick the pins in and flip it over and lock those in place. Your hanger tabs are going to be installed on each of the four corners here. You want to ensure that these bolts are facing in so you can screw the, uh, the nut from the inside. Your hangers will hang on the inside and always ensure your rubber uh, is on the outside corner that will be contacting your frame. Take your washer back on and tighten the nuts down. You'll repeat this process for all four corners. All right, your hanger tabs, all four of them are installed. You're gonna to wanna to install the shorter of the two. And I'm speaking shorter in this position here. you notice these are long, they hang out past. You will be provided an extra set of these if needed. We're talking about the four wear blocks on the corners of your speed plate. There will be four attached when you receive it and you also receive four extras. These can each be used twice, as in once you get too much wear on one side, you can simply flip it around and use the other side of it. The final piece of the speed plate is your safety bar. You're gonna to wanna to clip this on opposite end of the threaded wheel, which is gonna be your heavy, heavy end. That just keeps this from dropping down in the hole. Once your speed plate is locked into position in the frame, you're going to want to remove this before cutting operation. This is used in cases where you want to go ahead and use your six shooter to cut your hole and then maybe the following day come back with just your speed plate and your lifting device which interfaces right inside it and that will be used to lift your casting from the road without using the six shooter. The Mr. Manhole speed plate has hanger tabs located 
at the four corners. By removing two bolts through the hanger tab, you can vary the height. This is useful when you have castings which have an undercut of different thicknesses. Some castings have no undercut, so you may have to go all the way under the bottom of the casting frame to pull the casting. By varying the height of the hanger tab, it makes this possible. What we have here is an instance where the frame of the manhole is not over the center of the structure of the manhole. And we, when we rebuild, we want to make sure that we get that lined back up over the center of the structure. We also want an equal distance from frame to cut all the way around. So we want to get a, a hole cut that's centered up over the structure, but not centered up over the current location of the frame. Centered up over the location where the frame will be when we put it back together. So to do that, we're going to offset the center point of the speed plate. You can see now that we've set the center of the cut back up over the structure, not the frame. You can see that it's off-centered in the frame, but it's centered over the structure. And so when we cut this hole with the cutter extractor and pull everything out, when we go to rebuild, now that will allow us to put the frame back over the structure and it will be in the center of the cut that we made. We're talking about the dampening system that's built into the speed plate. There are four rubber blocks. You'll see one on each corner of the speed plate by the hangers. When you replace those, you need to make sure they're put back just the way they are when the speed plate comes to you. And then there's a rubber dampener behind the threaded adjusting rod. Very important that you keep that in and in good shape or you're going to be breaking those Acme rods. Also there's a nylon wear block in the center of the speed plate and it's replaceable. You want to keep your eye on that when it starts to wear. If you don't replace it, you're going to start wearing the metal keyhole out of the speed plate. It's easy to replace. There's one little bolt. You pull that out, pop the block out, put a new block in, and you're good to cut. The standard speed plate fits lid seat diameters from 17 inches to 25 and a half inches. The speed plate XL fits lid seat diameter sizes 23 inches to 43 and a half inches. The XL speed plate will be used in the utility manholes and they are quite heavy so you'll want to utilize that so you don't damage the standard speed plate. If you overextend the standard speed plate and then you pick up a large amount of weight you can bend or break the unit so make sure you're using the appropriate speed plate for the job. You want to remove all the parts for your California speed plate from the container. You can see how they're laid out. You want to lay them out just like this. Make sure you locate your hardware pack. It's going to be in a plastic container. The tools that you'll need to assemble the California speed plate are a 3 quarter inch wrench. You'll need a 9 16 socket and a ratchet. And you'll also need a 3 quarter inch socket. Alright, we're going to start our assembly here with the threaded wheel. Go ahead and screw that on. You're going to want your nut on the wheel facing outward. That'll line up and contact inside this here. And we'll simply slide this in the spots. All right, after you have this slid all the way in, you go ahead and hook your retainer clip here inside the wheel, and that simply snaps into slots provided. We're going to now slide the skinny end of the forks in. You'll notice the extra holes here. This allows you some adjustability to get your center spot center in your hole.
and you'll drop your long bolts in these two holes to lock that in place and turn it up on its side to put the nuts on the bottom And those will be tightened up using your three-quarter inch wrench and socket. Okay, we're now ready to install our hangers. There's four of these. One will go on each corner. They are adjustable up and down. And these can be made in various lengths because we can extend them out for you if needed. And those will be tightened down with your 9 16th inch. After install installing all four hanger tabs, you'll be left with just an extra Acme rod and this just to keep on hand as a spare part. This speed plate takes a lot of wear and a lot of abuse. What you want to do is lock tight all your studs in place and you want to lock tight your hangers on. You want to periodically check between uses and throughout the day to ensure they stay tight and reapply the Loctite as needed. Before using your Premier auger drive unit, read the manual for proper and safe usage. Many of you receive the Premier auger drive with your package. This auger drive is unique from other auger drives in that the attachment point here on a normal auger drive is back here and as you can see this gives us more distance from the front of the skid steer or the machine it's operating on for clearance for large diameter cuts we like to see this moved out just a little bit so this this auger drive has that feature built into it this auger drive runs on uh, most standard skid steers or backhoes. It needs at least 20 gallons a minute hydraulic flow. It has a two inch hex shaft with a three quarter inch hole for this grade eight pin. If you're using another auger drive, you want to make sure that A, it has a two inch hex drive. B, you want to make sure it, re it will accept a three quarter inch pin. Some don't. So be cautious about that. When attaching an implement to a backhoe or a skid loader, you want to make sure and follow the manufacturer's guidelines for safe attachment and safe removal from the machine. In the case of this auger drive and this six shooter, when attaching this unit to the skid steer, you want to make sure that the attachment points are securely engaged so that the machine is securely attached to the skid steer and doesn't fall off, damaging the six shooter, the auger drive, or injuring a bystander. Anything that we say is covered in the manuals that came with your skid loader, or your auger drive, we don't want to supersede any safety guidelines they give you. So please follow the manuals and operate safely with this equipment. While rubber tired skid steers work fine to operate this tool, you will experience a bumpy ride as an operator. That's why we prefer a track based machine the tracks are heavier, so they give the machine more ground weight and stability. And they also are harder, so they don't let the machine rock back and forth while the tool is cutting. It really comes down to operator comfort. That's why we recommend the tracks over rubber tires. We prefer the joystick controls. These are fly-by-wire controls, so everything is electronically sent down to the hydraulics. 
the reason we like that system, it makes it easier to maneuver the tool when you're inserting the guide shaft into the speed plate. Those operations become a lot easier. When you have an operator that's doing a lot of cutting in one day, it's really going to make his day go better to have these joystick controls. We like to have digital proportional hydraulic auxiliary controls. And that is the circuit that runs the auger drive. We like to be able to feather the hydraulic drive in and out to ease stresses on the cutter. So if at all possible, get a skid steer with that auxiliary hydraulic control that's variable so that you can feather in and feather out the rotation of the cutter. On the hydraulic auxiliary circuit, you must have at least 20 gallons a minute hydraulic flow. But if you have a machine with 35 gallons, which is considered high flow, that's a great feature to have with this. It'll really speed up your cutting in asphalt and softer materials. When you're cutting the harder concrete, you're going to want to slow that down. You may want to run it on the 20 gallons a minute side. The operator is responsible for the safe operation of these tools. The operator must inspect the bolts in the arms of the six shooter to make sure they're secure. That must be done several times throughout the day they can vibrate loose in use. So make sure you check to make sure they're tight. The bolts in the blades must be checked periodically to make sure that they're tight. We don't want a blade coming off while the unit is rotating and being thrown off and injuring someone. The operator must establish a safe zone, a perimeter. 20 feet outside of the cutter. If any person enters that safe zone, the operator must stop operating the equipment, put his hands on the glass to indicate that he's not giving any control inputs, and encourage that person to leave the safe zone and then start operating the tool again. Never operate the tool when anybody is inside the safe perimeter. The operator must not use the tool or transport the tool oriented in this fashion. The attachment point and indeed the seals and bearings inside the auger are not meant for this kind of loading. This tool weighs over a thousand pounds. To put that kind of a load on this seal and bearing it's not going to bode well for the auger. Also, the centering shaft, this bottom shaft, the guide shaft of the six shooter, is not meant to hold weight out. All it does is centers the machine for cutting. So when you pick the frame and the road overcut up, you want to make sure that the shaft is vertical, perpendicular to the ground, Never try to load the donut and frame onto a trailer or a truck because normally you'll have to rotate the machine up in this fashion and you put all that weight on the shaft and the auger drive unit is not going to stand that kind of use. So avoid using it to load any material. Just pull the overcut from the road and drop it and then pick it up with something else, some other piece of equipment, and load it out onto a truck or trailer. Never try to use the cutter extractor without a centering device. The speed plate is an absolute must. You will bend the teeth if you try to cut without the speed plate. I'd like to talk about attaching the tool to the auger drive and some of the things to be concerned about there number one the pin that we use to do the attachment it must be a grade 8 pin you're going to have one included with your package make sure if you have to replace it that you do use a grade 8 3 quarter inch 
and inspect this pen before every use and periodically throughout the day. It does take a lot of abuse, mainly picking up the donuts out of the road. The frame and lid with the road overcut is going to put a lot of stress on this. And also when you're cutting concrete or hard materials, it gets a lot of banging. So you may experience some cracking, breaking, bending of this pen. And uh, don't expect to get a thousand cuts out of a pen. You're going to have to have a few extra ones around and replace them uh, periodically. Also, let's talk about the welds. I want you to inspect these daily and uh, even more frequently than that throughout the day while you're doing your cutting. There's a lot of impact loading on these uh, welds and if they start to crack, you'll see that before any damage is done and you want to make sure you get that repaired. Just keep a close eye on that. Also, the bolts that attach this top assembly to the carrier disc. You want to make sure that they're torqued down to 200 foot-pounds and check them periodically. While they do have nylock retaining nuts on them, they may vibrate loose and if they do, they can start to do damage to the carrier. So check those frequently to make sure they stay tight. Let's talk about the bottom guide shaft assembly. Number one, you'll notice that there's a rubber isolation damper installed between the assembly and the carrier disc. We want to make sure that that remains in good shape. It's very important to absorb impacts. We also want to make sure that these bolts that hold this assembly to the carrier disc are kept torqued to 125 foot-pounds. It's very important. Inspect those frequently. There's a bolt right here. It's a grade 8 bolt and it holds the guide shaft to the guide shaft assembly. If this needs to be replaced, you'll be removing that bolt. Make sure that bolt stays tight. Torque it to 125 pounds and keep it that way. Inspect it frequently. Inspect the shaft for any damage, cracking. This shaft takes all the lateral pressures of the machine as it's cutting. Make sure it stays in good shape. If you need to replace it, there are replacement shafts available and it is replaced by removing that one bolt. Also, the key assembly is held in by an Allen screw right here in this hole. If at any time you remove this, say it wears and you want to replace it or you want to take it out for use with the Mr. Valve system, and you put it back in, you want to make sure that you put blue Loctite on that Allen key when you put it back in. And check this frequently to make sure that the Allen key's tight and that this isn't moving back and forth. This represents the end of the cutter extractor shaft which has a key. As you can see, there's a key shaped hole in the speed plate. To put this through that hole, the keys have to be lined up and it goes through. The only way it can come back out is if it's a line like that. If you turn it, go through and turn it sideways, it will not come out because the keys keep it from coming out. So we would use that function to pull the casting and overcut out. And then when we want to release, we'll rotate slowly and when the keys line up, out the shaft comes. So that's how the speed plate and the cutter extractor shaft work together to pull the manhole frames out of the road. This is the installation of your underslung fixtures. These are going to be used for cutting reduced diameters such as water valve boxes. Just cutting right outside of a manhole frame for a quick repair as in a paver adjusting after a repave. You'll notice that there's a set of holes that go horizontally through the arm. At some diameters you will need to use that hole for the bolt that holds this arm on because of an interference with a vertical application. You'll, you'll see that and uh, that's what that hole is there for.
Let's discuss the teeth that come with your six shooter. And let's talk about how they cut. On a rotary cutting machine, like a road milling machine, the teeth actually revolve and they enter the material and there's kind of an impact. With this type of cutting, it's a linear scraping action. So it depends a lot on the sharpness of this carbide element to do the cutting. You must make sure that these teeth remain sharp. When you're cutting harder materials and you run the machine very fast, the cutting point will actually skate or slide across the top of the material without cutting. And that will create friction. Heat will break down the carbide and it will get dull faster. And when it gets dull, it creates more heat, so it's a vicious cycle. Run slow in harder materials. Check frequently to make sure that the tooth remains sharp. Either replace the tooth, sharpen the tooth, but the tooth must remain sharp for the most effective cutting. If your receiver bar is damaged at some point, if something breaks on it or it wears on the sides, beyond the usable point you'll need to replace it to do so you'll measure down from the top 18 and three quarters of an inch you'll cut it off using a horizontal saw or some other cutting device and then you'll simply weld a new receiver strip on to replace or cycle teeth you'll have to remove the teeth we recommend a number eight centering punch that's a quarter inch size that works well you'll place it on the roll pin you'll need a ball peen hammer or some type of a hammer you'll drive that pin out remove the tooth move it to the new location drive a new roll pin in. This can all be done in the field without any power equipment, welding. Very convenient. The casting lifter can be used by up to four people by putting a bar or a 2 before through the center slot. Some of the castings are quite heavy. They can weigh up to 600 pounds, the utility casting, so you'll want to divide the weight between more than two people. This allows you to do that. This is your Mr. Manhole material package. There's enough material in this package to repair approximately 20 manholes with a 12 inch depth from street level to cone. When you're unpacking, this material be very careful if you'll notice this danger placard the rebar circles are very heavy and they're banded here vertically there's a board that's screwed in front of them that holds them on as well as the banding make sure you have provision to safely lift those before unfastening and unscrewing these retention devices this is a 27 inch package as indicated by this placard. You could also receive other sizes and they will reflect on this placard what the sizing is. So make sure you get the right size that you order. In this package you will have three pieces of this liner. You will have three cases of sealant. You will have 40 of the rebar rings you'll have three gallons of the pourable sealant you will have one box of the water stop strip you will have two bags of black dye and you'll have one package of wire ties for the rebar circles make sure that all of those items are in the package when you get it if you're missing anything contact us and we'll make sure that you get what you were missing We're going to talk about selecting the proper liner size for the casting frame that you have. We have a 27 inch liner on this frame 
and you can see that we've got a nice distance from the outside to the outside of the flange. That's important because this is what bears on the concrete and takes the weight of traffic. So we want to have at least two and a half to three inches, if not more, from the outside of the liner to the outside of the frame. If we were to use a 30 inch liner on this frame, we wouldn't have a lot of the frame uh, flange projecting out beyond the outside of the liner. So that wouldn't be the right choice for this frame. The 27 fits nicely. If you don't have a frame to do this comparison on, you might look in the manufacturer's catalog and it will give you the dimension from here to here, the inside dimension. It also will give you the outside dimension. You can use that drawing with dimensions to select the proper liner for the frames you're going to be using. This is the black die for your concrete surface that you receive with the material package. You'll want to apply this properly to get the best results. It doesn't take a large amount of this die to turn the concrete black. In fact, if you put too much of this material on the concrete, it can dry the surface and make it unworkable. So you'll want to use a coffee can or some other container that's approximately a gallon size container, a little less. Have some quarter inch holes drilled in the lid and then shake the material lightly across the surface. If it takes moisture from being stored in a moist environment, you may have to run it through a flour sifter. That will make it fine again and make it come out of the quarter inch holes at the right rate so that you don't get too much or too little on. It's a must for you installers that are trying to get production that you have a mini excavator with a hydraulic breaker on the job site. If you start cutting into a manhole and you know it's got two foot of concrete poured around it, you're not going to remove it with your cutter extractor. You'll be able to cut quite a ways down, but you won't be able to pull it out. In that situation, you're going to have to have a hydraulic breaker. It's just the only option that makes sense. We want to be safe. We want to protect our workers from injury. Air hammers are dangerous, and they take a lot of time to do what this tool can do in just a short amount of time. This machine is equipped with a quick connect where you can disconnect the bucket of the machine and add this breaker very quickly. It has the hydraulic attachments there, the accessory function. So, you know, all the operator's doing is just pushing a button and this thing's breaking the concrete. Please have one of these on the job. Don't try to get by without this. If you have to rent it, rent it. But buy it or rent it, do whatever you have to do, have one on the job at all times. Not only is it a must for the breaker, but the bucket, when you have it on there, is great to pull out the adjusting rings. So you're not manually trying to pull those adjusting rings off the cone. So this is a great tool to have. You can rent one, buy one, you can buy a real nice one, a more economical one. You can have a cab, no cab. A lot of options out there for you, but have a mini excavator on the job. The mini excavator, in addition to being used with the breaker, has the bucket that you see. And this one has been modified with a reese hitch inside the bucket. It's pretty simple modification. It has a piece of cold roll that fits right up inside that. And there's a pin that goes through that holds it in. You'll see this being used later in the video. We use it to clean the, the hole. We talk about how important it is to get the whole sides shaved straight down so that we don't have a conical repair. This is the tool that we use to get that done and it saves a lot of uh, manual labor in that function. So try to have one of these. If you look, the bucket also has the teeth brackets removed, the castings there that the teeth go on. There's no teeth, it's a straight 
flat edged bucket. That's real helpful for cleaning things out. Teeth tend to dig in and mar the top of the cone. So nice to have a smooth edged bucket as well as this reese hitch. It's also a small footprint bucket. Some buckets from some manufacturers are long from back to front they're very long so when you get in that excavation and start to curl your bucket the back of it's hitting and marring the road we don't want that we want to leave a real nice clean edge around that cut we made through the road so a short bucket like this is nice if you have a machine that's got a long bucket and you can't buy a bucket that's shorter you may have to make a special bucket or modify the bucket that you have the bucket also has a quick attach on it. We talked about that in relation to the hydraulic breaker. You definitely want a quick change. You don't want to spend a lot of time switching back and forth from breaker to bucket. So this makes it real easy. You pull one pin. Some even have a hydraulic quick attach. It's your option how you want to do that, but have a quick attach. on the bottom. Well those keys are lined up with these applied decals. These have to be lined up with the ends of the speed plate. Now he's in the proper orientation for pulling. When he goes to release the donut at the side of the road after he's pulled it, he's just going to set it down so it barely contacts the road. He's going to rotate the machine again and then you're going to see it drop right off. After you pull the donut out of here, guys, what you're going to do is take your tape and you're going to measure from the invert of the sewer. You're going to measure to the top of the cone. And then you're going to set your debris poles and pan to that height. Remembering that you're going to put a rubber mat on the top, so leave it an inch or two lower. 
When you're working on these right after you've cut the donut, you want to get the debris pan in. We've measured down to the flow line, the invert of the sewer, and we're inserting the debris pan. With, or the, we set the poles at the proper height and we're setting it down to the top of the cone. Now we're going to put our rubber mat in on top of that and force it down into place. Now what you've done is closed off the throat of the manhole so that no material can drop in there. You don't want to enter this manhole for any reason. So what we're going to do is block it off so that you don't have anything going down there. If you look at that now, nothing's going to go down in there. The next operation we're going to do is we're going to pull one ring off. There, there's one precast ring on this manhole to get us down to the cone. We always go to the cone, we never leave a ring on. So we're going to clean this stone out and we're going to clean that ring off. We've cut the donut out, we've gone through the debris prevention and all that, and we've cleaned the hole out. It's important a couple things. I've seen these concrete rings before in cities where they actually come up out of the pavement in frost conditions. So, you know, this repair is not going to do that, and I'll show you why. If you look at the sides of this, because of the way the cutter works, the sides are vertical. They're straight down. If you have a side that you did with an air hammer and it's kind of sloped in, then pressure coming in like this is going to make it come up. It's going to squeeze it from the sides and push it up because it's a cone. Very important that you clean this straight down. You can see that we've gone just a little bit deeper than the top of the cone. If you look at the specifications, that's what it's calling for. You want to make sure you do that. You want to make sure that there's stone here, not mud. You want water to go down and away. If water goes down and away, frost isn't going to heave this near as much. So those are the considerations that you want to make sure you do when you're cleaning this out, getting ready for the repair. On the cone cleaning, you're checking for a couple things here. First, you don't want standing water, you don't want mud, and you don't want humps or voids in the top of the cone. You're going to want to fill any big voids with a speed creep material, something that dries really fast. And then if you've got a hump, you want to take a diamond face grinder wheel, maybe on a 9 inch grinder, a 7 inch grinder, and knock that flat. You can actually take a piece of insert liner and set on there and see if it rocks. If it does, mark that spot and grind it until the insert liner doesn't rock. And then, you're going to want to have a wire brush on hand and a soft bristle, fairly soft bristle brush, some uh, shop towels, and some acetone. Acetone is good to use because it's going to take off any like residue from other sealants that might have been on there, and it dries fast. It's, it's kind of like alcohol. It dries really fast. It'll actually dry up standing water a little bit. You know, if you put it on and let it dry, air dry, it'll take the water off. As you can see, looking at this manhole, it's a masonry structure. We've removed a few rows of brick, uh, nothing real level to start the rebuild off of. So we've added a precast concrete ring to give us a flat surface to build off of. And you're going to see how we use the liner and the tools that come with your package to do this rebuild and get the frame and lid level with the road. At this stage of the operation, we want to determine how much liner we need to get the frame level with the road. So we're going to put a level across from one side to the other, and we're going to measure. We're going to do this in several points so that we can determine the highest point and cut the liner accordingly. We've got a measurement of 9 and 3 eighths. Now we'll have to determine what the height of the casting is and then subtract that from the 9 and 3 eighths and that will give us the length of the liner. Let's take a minute to talk about types of castings. As you can see this casting has a ridge or a flange that comes down from the uh, edge of the main flange. 
we want to be sure that that's not going to interfere with the location of the liner so if you take a piece of 27 inch liner and you place that on the bottom you can see how that's going to hit right on that flange probably not the ideal size liner to use for that frame well, let's try a piece of 30 and see where it falls this is a 30 inch liner and as you can see it is big enough to go outside of the flange we want to get the measurement of the frame from top to bottom and we don't want to include that that flange because we're not going to be putting that right on top of the liner so let's show you how we get a measurement to get the measurement of the frame and lid and transfer it over to the easy slope marking device we're going to use this caliper that's included in your package as you can see we went inside the frame we went from the top to the bottom we tightened it and set it and now we're going to use that to transfer over to the easy slope marker in a case where you've got a flange and your caliper will not work with that flange we want to use an alternative method of determining casting height so we're going to put a level on the top we're going to measure to the bottom of the flange we've got seven and three quarters inches we're simply going to transfer that measurement over to the marking device we're going from the top of the measuring hub to the bottom of the marker and now we'll simply tighten that up that sets screw and we're ready to use the marker we determined the height from the cone to the road surface and we've deducted the height of the manhole frame from that we're going to have a safety margin so we're going to cut a slightly longer piece four or five inches long and we're going to mark this bigger section of liner we'll mark it several places around and then we're going to use a battery powered saw to cut this short section off now that we've got a short piece of the liner cut we're going to place it on the manhole cone and we're going to mark it so that when we take it off and cut it and replace it we have it in the same orientation so we'll just use a little bit of paint put a couple marks after marking and cutting when we place it back on the cone it's in the exact same orientation what you're looking at is the easy slope tool system that will allow you to mark accurately your liner and cut it to the height and slope of the road we're going to show you how these components work. The Easy Slope system will work on an aluminum six foot level. We're going to show you how the components attach to the level. You've got your end plates. They'll go on the end and then they'll tighten down. We have the center section which attaches to the center of the level. It doesn't have to be extremely tight, just snug it down. Now we're going to install the marker that you received with your package. You'll see how the tip is oriented. We want that sideways, just like you see it, and you want to slide it all the way in. You'll want to keep the cap on this when you're not using it so it doesn't dry out, and you'll want to avoid damage to the tip. When you use this marker, you want to make sure that you push the point of the marker in the direction of travel. You don't want to drag the point away from the direction of travel. It will deform the tip. When the tip becomes deformed, your accuracy will diminish. We're using the Easy Slope marker to put a line on the liner. We're going to cut on that line with a battery powered saw and that's going to give us the correct height and slope to bring the frame to road level. When we're using the Easy Slope Marker System, it's a one-man operation. You want to avoid running the skid plates on the end into any declivities that might be in the road. You want to watch that you don't press too hard with the marker. And you want to continue around the liner and get the mark all the way around. Now we're ready to cut the liner. We're going to remove it from the cone. We're going to use a battery powered saw to cut on the line. Let's talk about cutting the liner. You'll want to use a battery powered saw with a decent sized battery. This is a 36 volt DeWalt. Works well for this application. Let's talk about setting the blade to the proper height. We want to get through the material, but we don't want a lot of blade protruding out. It'll cut easier and it'll be safer. 
It's a two-man operation for safety. Make sure you wear safety equipment, gloves, safety glasses. And the operator of the saw will place his foot in the bottom of the liner and he'll operate the saw. The second worker will hold the pipe and rotate the pipe towards the saw operator. We want to make sure and cut on the bottom of the line. Remember, this is the bottom of the material that was setting on the cone. You can tell that by the paint marks that are on it to locate it back on there. And we want to cut on the bottom because that's where the measurements were taken on the marker. So let's begin the cut. Not only will this repair be level with the height and slope of the road and look nice, it will also be watertight and vacuum testable. We're going to apply the Mr. Manhole liner sealant on the bottom of this liner. This is the part that's going right down on the cone. So we're going to use a battery powered caulk gun or whatever you have available for the 28 ounce tubes and we're going to apply a liberal amount of that Mr. Manhole sealant to bond that down to the cone. Okay, we're going to place this piece of liner back on the cone. We're going to match it up with the orientation mark. We're going to push it down so that we set that sealant on the cone, making sure that we don't have any voids. Remember, we're making a watertight repair and a vacuum tight repair. On the inside, we wanna wipe the sealant in a nice bead. This does two things. It makes it look better and it also reveals any shortages of material that we might have. We can fill in any voids if we see any at that time. Okay, we wanna make sure we have enough of the sealant to bond the bentonite strip to the cone. If you've got any light areas on the outside, you wanna make sure you touch that up. We're going to apply the bentonite strip and that will seat right into the sealant that squished out on the outside. You'll see that the strip has a 45 degree angle on a couple sides and you want to put that in on a 45 degree angle. So we'll show you how that goes in. You'll start it. Try to keep it out of the dirt because it's sticky. Dirt will get on it. We don't want that. And then just work your way around the repair installing the material. When we get it all in place, then we'll remove the paper wrapper. Remember, for those of you that are working for municipalities, this specification is available on our website. You can download it. We have it on disk. So anybody that wants to adopt this specification, we make it very easy for them to do so. Okay, once you've wrapped the material all the way around the liner, then you want to go ahead and cut it the right length, and you want to knead it together. This material will swell in the presence of water and will keep any leakage from occurring in this chimney section. Okay, we want to apply a bead of sealant. We're going to glue the manhole frame directly to the liner. This is going to be our final seal. We want to make sure and do this, especially if we're vacuum testing. This will bond the frame down to the liner and will be the final seal for uh, vacuum testing purposes. We'll prohibit any water from penetrating into this repair. We're going to be replacing the existing frame you can see we're placing it gently down on that liner and then seating it in that uh, sealant. We're now replacing the lid. If there was a problem with level, this would be the time to fix it. But as you can see, it's perfect. You do want to check with the flow of traffic.
What we're going to talk about in this segment of the video is how you communicate with the concrete driver to get you know the, the manhole poured back in the way you want it without damaging it. A lot of guys, you know, they want to do it the way you want it done, but if you don't communicate with them properly, then it's not going to happen. So what I would say is, Tom, this is the concrete driver for this truck. When he arrives on the job, I would say, Tom, I want this about a four and a half inch slump. We're using a six and a half bag mix concrete. I always order it at a four and a half inch slump. You don't want it real wet because if you're on a slope, it's all going to try to come around to the low side. And then I would say, Tom, we're going to pour three inches in in a ring. And as soon as we get that three inches in, my guy will put a reinforcing ring in. You just keep right on pouring. Go right on around and we'll go to the top of this manhole and then we'll put another ring in. The reason I don't want a lot on one side, it could push the insert liner off one side, leaving a hole and concrete would go into the manhole. So it isn't hard, it's just common sense, but if you don't communicate and the guy's never done it before, he's probably gonna disappoint you. So, and if this truck is a front loader, which the operator can see exactly what's going on. In a lot of cities we work in, they're rear dumps. So you're gonna be running the chute. Very important that you discuss hand signals with the driver so he knows what he can't do what you don't tell him. So hold your arm out where he can see, discuss hand signals before you start to pour so he knows what your hand signals mean and then communicate. He'll only do what you tell him to do. So, you know, help him out, make his job easy. From this point, all we have left is to pour the ready mix concrete in. That usually takes about five minutes. So pay attention to how we do this because I've seen people take a lot of time doing this. There's no need to. It can go really fast. Now what we're gonna do at this point we're going to check the slump of the concrete. We're going to see what it looks like. So we'll just have him run a little bit out. Don't let him run two or three wheelbarrows out. Just run enough so that you can see the consistency. And then we'll adjust the water content of the concrete accordingly. When you're pouring this, you want to be careful not to get concrete outside of the cut on the asphalt. Later, that concrete will stay there. And it's you know, when you're doing a repair like this, you want it to look nice. It's part of being professional. So don't let your guys slop concrete all over the road. There's no need to do it. Just take a little extra time and caution, communicate with the driver, and you can make a nice, neat repair without having concrete all over the place. Another aspect of this is we don't want concrete on the lid of the manhole. So to keep that from happening, we just take one of our debris prevention mats and we lay it on the lid just while we're putting the concrete in from the truck. And then we just take it off and go to the next manhole. That's about the consistency you want it. I wouldn't want it much wetter than that because if you get on any kind of a slope with that, it's not going to be staying up. We don't vibrate this until we get it all the way to the top. There's no real need to vibrate it at this point. Now we put the first rebar ring in. We'll let him run it to about that height right there. Put the second one in. Down just a little bit. Now we're going to go all the way to the top. Okay, the final rebar ring, push it down about three inches, remove the mat, the main thing we're after with the vibrating is obviously we're consolidating the entire ring, but we want to get the concrete under the flange of that casting. That's what's given us our structural stability there. It's under the casting, it's locking in under and around the casting. We want to make sure there's no air voids. So that's that's what the vibrating process is about. We're using a battery powered DeWalt vibrator. Running on an 18 volt battery. That's a nice little vibrator. 
The one thing that you can do here, if you had a huge vibrator, an electric one, you could shift the whole repair sideways. That's why we've selected this. It's getting just about the right amount of vibration to not move the repair, but still get the concrete consolidated in under that casting tool. I want to point out one thing to you guys who are repairing. We don't want a hump right here because little humps translate to big bumps in cars. We don't want that. We want to go from the frame point A, so keep it clean when you're magging this off or floating this off. From here to the road, it needs to be one plane. No dip, no hump. We've gone to this extreme to take this manhole out and replace it and repair it. Let's get it done right. It's not that hard to do. Train your guys to be sensitive about that. Make sure it's flat. Now what we're going to do is take an edger. That's Hold that up, Galen. That's called an edger. It's going to put a radius edge on the outside of this repair. Here again, you want to be a little have a little finesse because you don't want to change the elevation of the concrete. All you're doing is putting a little radius on it. You'll see later in the process why we're doing this. We're opening up a joint to pour some sealant in. We want to seal that interface between the concrete repair and the existing asphalt. So we make that little radius to pour that material in. Now you can see that they've got this thing fairly smooth. This isn't the finished product, but they've got it fairly smooth. The next function is going to be ap applying the dye, the black dye. The next function will be applying the black dye on the surface and working it in. This isn't extremely difficult, but it takes a little common sense. You don't want to over apply this material. I'll show you how we, we do it here. We've got this beautiful Folgers plastic can with the top. We drilled some, looks like quarter inch holes in it. We got the black powder in there. This is the powder that ships to you with all of your material packages. And this allows you to apply it. And you know, we try to get a nice cover on this thing. In other words, don't put all the powder right there and think that's going to do the job. Spread it out to the edges, bring a little bit right to the edge here, and just go around in a circle, make sure you cover everything nice and even. It doesn't take a huge amount of it. But you want to get enough on so that you're black. Remember that what looks really black today in a week or two is not going to look that way. It'll be bright, it'll be gray because it cures out, it lightens up in the sun. And it and you can also see how if you put too much on, it's going to dry the surface up really fast. So you've got to kind of just it's just a little bit uh, sensitive as far as how much you put on in the way you work it in. If you've got a crew of guys that don't know a lot about concrete finishing, they're probably going to have a little learning curve on getting these things to look beautiful. This guy here has been doing it for years and he's making it look really easy. A lot of it has to do with the angle of the mag as you're you know, using the mag around there. You can tilt it up a little bit more if the material seems sticky so you're kind of breaking that suction. Don't let your guys sprinkle water on it. Water weakens the surface of concrete and it'll start to flake off, so don't let them do that. Settle for a little bit less beauty in the finish and get a higher quality repair by not putting water on it. Now once he gets this all magged off, we call these magnesium floats, so we call them mags. Once he gets it magged or floated, then we're going to brush it in a circle and you're going to see him do that. Try to do this brushing process in a way that's a perfect circle around the manhole lid. It just looks nicer. You've spent this much time to make a quality repair, why not make it look nice? Just follow those circles right around.
Okay, now you're going to see why we put the radius edge on the concrete. We use that edging tool to make the radius edge, and this is why. We're going to seal this edge with this crack filler. This is the pourable brewer coat asphalt crack filler that ships with the material packages. You'll get enough of this to do 20 manholes with each of the material units. And it just, you know, you cut the spout off about right there and it'll pour right in there. All we're trying to do is just fill that crack. So just let it pour out. If it's cold weather, you want to keep it warm in the cab of the truck. Again, any of these steps that you're seeing here, they're all reflected in the specifications that are downloadable on our website. So you can check if you don't understand any of this or if you've got any questions or if your engineers have questions about any of the specifications or the materials, it's all in the specs. Download it, print it, take a look at it, make sure you understand it. You know, if you're gonna do this kind of work, you ought to be able to answer the questions that engineers and administrators of municipalities are going to ask you. Know your product. Okay, the last step of this repair, we're almost done. We're going to take a concrete sealer like Yuko makes a product called Res Seal. It's a Euclid product. It's the last stage of this. The reason we do it is because it's going to protect the concrete from water penetrating it it's going to make it more durable. It's actually going to cure it slower so that it will be more durable, impervious to salt, freeze and thaw, those kinds of things. You want your repairs to last. So just take that one step. We don't ship that product. It's too volatile, but you can order it from your concrete supplier. Any product that's comparable to Res Seal will work. It's just a medium solid sealer. In order to protect this repair now until tomorrow morning, which is when we're going to open it to traffic. 24 hours you can open it to traffic. We're going to put this poly cover on. It's a half inch thick polyethylene material. You can buy them off of our website. And it, it does a couple things. It protects the repair. It also protects it from rain. It protects it from frost because think about it. It's 50 degrees inside that mantle and heat rises. So. This material has a thermal quality to it, so when you throw it down on there, it retains the hydration heat of the concrete, plus the heat that's just inherent to the manhole. It, we don't recommend that cars drive over it, although if an automobile drove over this, all it would really do is dent the concrete just a little bit. This will actually bridge the repair. You wouldn't have to completely remove that repair if a car drove over it when this is on there. So, Galen's going to put a little block of wood on the lid and all that's doing is it's just holding the poly pad up a little bit so it doesn't contact the fresh concrete. Now we'll just barricade the repair off and we're ready to go to the next one. The Mr. Manhole off-road chimney replacement method is used to replace these unsightly frames that we see in the tree lawns or right of ways located in the grass areas. We're going to remove those and replace them with an attractive concrete structure that is durable and leak free. We'll be using the Mr. Manhole materials. We'll need a flat surface to begin the construction. We're using a cardboard tube called a sauna tube or an easy pour tube will give you contact information on those products at the end of the video. This system will allow your workmen to work in weather conditions that they wouldn't be able to work in with an on-site repair. It's going to save time and money and it is a lot easier to get a concrete truck into a shop than it is someone's backyard or uh, a place where they might make tracks and so forth. The men will be 
shortening the rebar circles that are provided with the Mr. Manhole tools and using the excess as you'll see demonstrated. Take the excess we cut off, we're going to cut it into four pieces, 12 inches long or so. Could be a little bit less so we stay under in our height if we get a 12 inch fixture. We're going to stick them in the four holes then, the flange. We'll be using ready mix concrete to pour these structures and keep in mind you may be pouring more than one. You'll want to vibrate the concrete under the flange of the casting. Install your reinforcing rings as per the Mr. Manhole specification and continue the pour to the top of the structure. If you have any questions regarding the Mr. Manhole off-road method, please contact Mr. Manhole support at the number on the screen. We'll be putting a slight slope on the top of the structure. Remove the sauna tube or the cardboard ring, clean up any rough edges, and the structure will be ready to install. You'll want to mark out the excavation slightly larger than the structure. Apply the mastic and the Mr. Manhole sealant. These products are both available from Mr. Manhole. Set the structure down on top of the cone. Replace the lid and backfill. The Mr. Manhole system speeds new construction and road reconstruction by removing the manhole chimney structure from the equation by putting a steel plate on the cone at dirt level and then running the road stone base, the asphalt base, and the finished layer of asphalt as if the structure did not exist. After that process, we'll go back, find the location of the steel plate either by GPS, triangulating, or a magnetic locating button that's embedded in the steel plate. An auger is twist locked onto the shaft of the cutter. It's used to expose the hole in the steel plate. The auger is then twisted off of the shaft of the cutter extractor and that shaft is placed through the hole in the middle of the steel plate and the road is cut in a perfect circle, full penetration cut. The steel plate, the stone above the steel plate, the base layer of asphalt, and the finished layer of asphalt is then lifted by the cutter extractor from the road. And the rebuild process happens with the Mr. Manhole rebuilding system. These new methods put the control of quality and speed back into your hands as a municipality. These are not just speculative methods. These are methods that are currently in use. In Allen County of Ohio, on State Route 81, there was a one-mile stretch that had 54 of these manhole structures. This method was used. The pavers did their work. The Mr. Manhole crew came in in four days, raised all the structures to grade, and remember, they were leak-free, vacuum-testable, perfectly level structures done in four days, and the road was opened on the following day. This is a great option to traditional methods when it comes to new construction or rebuilding existing roads. What we're looking at here is an overhead view of a street and some curbs. The best way to locate these would be to make a mark on the curb here and a mark on the curb here and then pull a measurement from this mark to the center of the plate and from the center of the plate to this mark. What your schematic would look like when you're writing this information down is you'd have manhole A and you'd have point one and point two 
on Manho A, point A1 would equal, let's just say, 64 feet. And point A2 might equal 70 feet. So you keep a list, Manho A, that's your data. You go back here, you know approximately where Manho A is. You pull off a point one, say it's a little X on the curb, and you've marked it with a one, and you mark this one with a two, you pull those two points, you're right over the center of the plate. We prefer this method of location if we have points that aren't going to be disturbed. But if you're out in the middle of a dirt field and you have no points of reference that you can depend on being there when the streets are done, you better use the magnetic locators. To block off this hole so nothing gets down in there, we use this plastic plug. It has a magnet embedded in it. It's polarized north. That's important. South and north is the polarity of the magnet. We're going to place it in the hole, and that's going to stop anything from going down in there. It's going to allow us to find this location later. After the paving operation is complete, we're going to want to find the structure again so we can cut it out and repair it. We'll have a general idea of where the manholes are located. They're every 250, 300 feet, depending on what the rules are in that subdivision, but we'll have marked them previously, so we're in the ballpark. We'll get on the new asphalt with this locator. It's just a discriminating locator that reads the polarity of magnetism, so it's going to have a red indicator when it's reading the north polarity and a green when it's reading the south. These are polarized north, remember, up. So when we come along and find these, you'll see that they're going to be reading red on the top side, green on the bottom side. So when we come along, we're going to get that strong red reading right over the center of this. And we'll make a paint mark right over the center. We auger down through the asphalt and stone. We remove the plug. And then it's a simple matter of taking the Mr. Manhole shaft right down through the hole, cutting, and when we pick up, we get this plate and everything above this plate comes right out. We're discussing the centering system for the Mr. Valve cutter. Whenever you cut with the cutter, you've got to have a centering system. So for the valves, typically we're going to be using the cone. It's a 80 plus pound steel centering cone that the shaft of the cutter goes down through. It can rock a little bit in the casting so that we can get the proper alignment. You're going to put that in. The key will be removed from the shaft of the cutter so that it slides right down through that round hole. And then we're going to make our cut with the underslung teeth. For those of you who are seeing the Christie type casting openings in your city, you're going to want to use one of two options. You can either use the cone and a reducer ring, and all that's going to work just like you've been using other than you have that reducer ring, which allows the cone to fit in there properly. Or you can use our Christie speed plate, which works similar to the Mr. Manhole speed plate in a manhole. It locks in place. You're going to have the key in the shaft now, and you're going to go down through the key-shaped hole. You're going to make your cut around the casting, and then you're going to pull the road overcut and the Christie apparatus out of the road. I recommend that you use the Christie speed plate. It's a big labor saver. You're not going to have to use the breaker or the blaster. You can just cut and pull. We're showing the Mr. Valve blaster. It's hanging on a mini excavator, which is powering the hydraulics of the unit. The unit is used after we use the cutter with the underslung teeth to cut a 28 inch groove or whatever diameter you have it set on around the valve box. Because we can't pull these valve boxes, we've chosen to just break them off of the piece that goes on down and covers the valve. You know, these screw on over a smaller diameter box. The valve blaster is made so that it will not go into that smaller diameter down tube that goes over the valve. It'll only go into the top part. So we hang it on the mini. 
we drop it down in and then we activate it it actually breaks the valve box casting and it breaks the road overcut around the casting before you put the valve blaster in and break this you want to go ahead and put a rubber ball with a string on it available at any toy store Put that down inside there and shove it down into the secondary uh, smaller piece so that none of those pieces fall down in around the valve. Now we will lower the Mr. Valve Blaster unit down into that casting for breakage. This unit can be used on a mini excavator like you see it demonstrated here or it can be used on a skid steer anything that will provide the hydraulic power to activate it you can hang it on put it on any tool you want as long as it has a hydraulic feed when you've cut these and removed these from the road cleaned everything out you can pour the concrete back in with a small piece of 3 8 rebar uh, you can just bend that yourself and pour this back in and dye the top black just like you see on the mr. manhole repairs in the rest of this video we have the standard length, which is going to cut 12 to 14 inches, depending on how you're oriented above the road. We have the longer or extended length, which is going to give you right at 20 inches. When you're using these, they may necessitate the use of the extended shaft. For instance, if you've got the extended thong, your teeth might touch the road before you get through the speed plate. So in that event, you can pull the standard shaft out and use this extended shaft. It has three holes for the key. So you can decide at what level you want that key in there and then you can move it to one of those holes that's appropriate. And that should get you through some of those situations where you have to reach way down in to get to the speed plate. There will be certain applications where you need to cut a larger diameter than what your standard arm will let you cut. In those cases, you can get an extra 12 inches in diameter by installing the extensions. You simply remove the cutting blade, apply the extension, and then reinstall the cutting blade, and you'll be cutting a larger diameter. The debris prevention system is what we use to keep materials from falling into the manhole when we're taking out the old adjusting rings and cleaning out the stone in the excavation. It's going to be put into the manhole right after the cutter extractor pulls the frame and the road overcut from the road. Remember, during that process, centrifugal force is throwing the debris outwards away from the hole. Everything after that we have a potential of dropping something in the manhole. We don't want to get in the manhole to clean it. We don't want anything going down there. So we're going to use this system. The way the system works, we're going to take a measurement. From the cone of the manhole to the flow line of the sewer, which is where the foot of the system will set, right in the flow line. So if you've got a flow line going across here, that's going to set right in the bottom of that flow line. That's the basis of our measurement. So then we have the pull, which you're going to get multiple sections of this extendable pull to get you to the dimension that you need. You've got the top of the debris system, which is a metal plate with holes in it so you can grab it and get it into position. You've also got the rubber uh, mat, remembering that that mat is approximately an inch thick you want to take a measurement from the cone to the flow line subtract an inch for that rubber mat and then let's say you've done that and you come up with 52 and a half inches now you want to put the system together so you're going to snap the foot on put the pin in place you're going to put the top of the unit on, snap it in place. Now you're going to pull a measurement from right inside there, the top, down to the bottom. And you can see by extending it back and forth and working with it, you're going to come up with the dimension you needed. 52 and a half inches, it might be 16 feet, 18 feet, 26 feet. You can put as much on as you want to get where you need to be. 
For some of you, you're going to find that you need to cut these poles. You need one set of these poles that you cut in half. That will give you some latitude on getting a specific measurement. You may find that you can't get the measurement you need with full poles. You may have to cut a set in two. You can order more of these on our website if you need them, but it's pretty certain that you're going to have to cut one of your poles in two. This is a saw that we recommend every installer of the Mr. Manhole system have. It is uh, an ICS saw. It is like a chainsaw with a diamond segmented blade. And you can use this where you get in a situation that maybe you've got granite aggregates in your concrete and you can't cut with the Mr. Manhole cutter. So you might be able to score a groove down a couple inches and then take this saw out and plunge cut and go right around that circle and you'll end up with a nice cut. It cuts 16 inches deep. It's running on gas. Uh, we'll show you a couple of the features of the saw itself. But we recommend that you have this along with a water source on your truck at all times. Uh, this one needs water. Uh, they, all, they all need water, but this one has a water hose which comes with it, valved and brass fittings. Uh, we have a 16 inch bar on this particular model. You can get 14s. We like the 16 better for depth of cut. Uh, diamond chain. Uh, you can also get these in hydraulic powered which can be run off of your mini excavator or your skid loader with a uh, flow reducer. So we recommend that you have eight gallons a minute flow at 20 psi. 20 psi and also we recommend that you carry an extra chain you can't just go down to Walmart and buy those, so just have some extra ones. These will really get you out of a pinch when you need, need it. It's invaluable. If you use it, say you run into rebar, and you use this to cut, this is cutting about a 3 8 inch wide groove, and your Mr. Manhole cutter extractor is going to cut about an inch and a half groove. So you're going to have to make two cuts right where the rebar are, and then let your cut or blow the little chunk of rebar that's left in there out of the way. So just remember you can't make one cut where the rebar is and then expect that your cutter is going to, to go right through that. So make sure you keep one of these on your truck. They're in the $2,000 range, $2,500. It's a lot of money, but when you need it, it's invaluable. For the ICS saw, it has to have water to cool the blade. You can see this water tank. It's a simple tank that's available at any farm store. You can carry some water with you and a section of hose and now you can run that saw with the proper coolant. So always have that water with you and have that ICS saw. Okay, what we're talking about today is the specifications for the Mr. Manhole repair. We want to cover each aspect of this repair uh, so we know what we're doing, how we're doing it, and the materials we're using to affect the repair and uh, make sure that these repairs are done the same way every time. So it's important that we understand the drawings, the material requirements, and, and the sequence of events. So we find the pre-existing condition where the manhole frame and lid is lower than the asphalt surrounding it. And we're trying to correct that by removing the manhole frame and lid using the Mr. Manhole Cutter Extractor. After removing the manhole frame and lid from the road and the surrounding road overcut is removed and we want to make sure we get a full penetration vertical cut on this removal process. A lot of times when people use an air hammer, in fact in almost every case, they will have this cut sloped like this as opposed to being vertical and what happens to those repairs is as freeze and thaw occurs, lateral force is pushing into that conical 
repair and it causes that repair to raise up out of the ground. You see that a lot where the concrete is actually raised. And if you think about it in a frost condition when you've got a quarter of an inch frost movement and it affects this repair, it's also going to affect the road surrounding. And so you would never notice a properly done repair moving. Even though it might move up and down a little bit, it will move at the same rate the surrounding road moves. The reason this will move at a faster rate is because of lateral frost expansion from the surrounding asphalt. So it's very important to get a full vertical cut even below the asphalt pavement. The existing aggregate has to be trimmed straight down and that's what the Mr. Manhole cutter extractor allows you to do. At the same time you'll notice this three inch over excavation below the top of the cone. Very important so that we have drainage away from the bottom of the concrete repair and after we excavate that down further on in the repair process we're going to add a little aggregate back in there so we've got a nice drainage bed away from this repair also if you've got a mud situation which it's pretty rare most of these are back filled with stone all the way to the bottom of this manhole structure if you find one that has mud in it at this level we need to auger down with a six inch auger we usually just carry one of those on the truck and it'll have about a three foot bit on that. You can auger down till you get to the stone and then fill that hole, that augered hole. You fill that with number 57 stone, a three quarter inch aggregate, so that it will allow this area right below the repair to drain away. And it's important that we get water to drain away from that repair. If you have standing water under that repair, you've got more of a chance of frost heaving it up and down in frost conditions. That's why we put the bentonite seal in, that water activated seal, right on top of the cone. In case we get a little frost movement and there would be some water present, which typically when there's frost, there's no running water. But just in case we have that water activated strip in there, keep that interface from leaking. So let's move on over here and work through this thing. Here we have the repair excavated and cleaned and now we're ready to start the repair. I might address the top of the cone. Now this drawing shows kind of a perfect world situation where the cone is nice and flat. It's constructed of precast concrete and that's great and a lot of times you will encounter that. Sometimes though you'll find one where the top of the cone has a little divot or a depression in it or it might even have a hump of some sort. What we recommend is putting your insert liner piece down on the cone initially and checking to see if you've got a high spot or a low spot and then taking actions like grinding or filling to rectify that situation before you start the rebuild. The other thing that needs to happen at this point, you need to clean the concrete off. If we're dealing with precast concrete, you want to make sure that none of the old sealants which had bonded the previous rings down or mortars or any of that are there. You don't want any residues on that cone. So we'll wire brush that, we'll use an acetone to clean it up real well, wipe it down with a clean rag make sure that it has no humps or divots and then we'll start our rebuild. If it's a masonry structure now you've got to pick an appropriate level to take the masonry down to because there's no clear line of demarcation between the cone and the chimney section. You'll have to pick one so that you've got a, a decent sized piece of liner in there. You're shooting for five plus inches of liner material. So if you've got a seven inch casting and lid apparatus and five inches of liner material, that's gonna put you roughly 12 inches below the road. And that's pretty much what we're shooting for typically. 
So you find the appropriate masonry joint to go to, remove enough material to get to that joint, and then you may have to grind the masonry flat so you've got something to start on. Now, in a situation where you've got a masonry manhole that cones out rather quickly, you may find that you're down in this area when you, so you're getting bigger than your liner once you get down to the level you're going to go to. What you want to do there is take a precast concrete ring, about a two inch height concrete ring, and you'll make a reducer out of that. And you'll grout that to the top of that cone, and then you'll start your rebuild off of that precast masonry. Once you start the rebuild, you want to start right here at the cone level. We're going to cut it to the proper height and slope, and you're going to take your piece of insert liner, put a liberal amount of the white sealant, it's a urethane sealant, to the bottom of the insert liner and then turn it over and press it down onto the cone, making sure that you've got no wobbling or voids under that liner. If you've got any voids, you want to fill those with the urethane sealant and wipe it in on the inside. You want to let it squish out on the outside. That's important because it's going to help bond the next seal on. You need to make sure you put enough sealer on there so that you, it'll bond the uh, water stop when you put that on. Next thing we do is we move to the water stop. We press it in. It has an angled edge on each uh, edge of that. and You want to press those angles in so it's laying on a 45 degree angle. There's a little blow up of the uh, water stop. It should lay crossways like a 45 degree and you press it in when you wrap that bentonite around this repair there will be a joint where the two ends come together knead it together so that you've got a secure seal then we'll put another liberal amount of the white sealant at the top of the insert liner after the cut and place the manhole frame back on to the insert liner and check across the top with a level you check with the line of traffic. Now we want to make sure that we've got some three-quarter inch aggregate right in this area. Remember how we over excavated on the preparing and removing process. That was why we took it down three inches. Now we're going to put the three-quarter inch aggregate in. Sometimes you'll find a manhole that the aggregate's already there. If that's the case, no need to excavate. If it's muddy or you're unsure about drainage, go ahead and do this step right here. When you put that aggregate in, don't come all the way to the top of the cone. Leave it down a half inch or so because we want concrete to lock over that edge just a little bit so we don't get lateral movement, shifting of this repair. You can see the epoxy coated rebars and where they're placed in the drawing. Uh, follow those directions. This is going to keep the concrete in one piece, which makes this repair more secure. It's going to keep water from migrating through any cracking that may occur in this. And it will keep the insert liner from being shifted on the top of the manhole. So observe the placement of your rebars. I might add the rebars are not in a specific diameter when they come to you. They're, they have an overlap and it's variable. So you want to select the right diameter for the cut you're making. And the cuts vary because of the different frame sizes. And to achieve this rebar placement that's shown on the drawing, you have to change that overlap and tie those securely with a wire, couple wire ties on each re-rod ring. When you get to the top of of the uh, repair with the pouring process, you want to vibrate adequately to get concrete under the manhole frame. That is becoming your cast in place, epoxy rebar reinforced adjusting ring, perfectly sized for this manhole that you're repairing. The area above the flange is the collar and the reason we specify concrete all the way to the surface as a collar, concrete does not dip or cup like asphalt does. And it doesn't get humped up because 
when you're putting in asphalt, if you get a little bit too much in, you can roll all you want, but you're going to have a hump between the edge of the flange and the edge of the cut. And that's going to translate into a bump with traffic, cause bumping and then impact loads on this frame that are unnecessary. So when you pour this concrete, make sure to get it flat from the edge of the cut over to the edge of the frame. And then we dye that black with dye that we provide in our material packages. And I might add that all the material we're specifying here comes in the Mr. Manhole material packages. They're packaged in units of 20 manholes each and they'll have everything you need except for the ready mix concrete and the concrete sealer that we spray right on top of the concrete after the repair. Everything else is included in there. After you've poured the concrete and put a nice brush finish on that black surface, then the next step is to fill this void with the Brewer Coat pourable asphalt seal that we provide with the material packages. We want to make sure we get a three quarter inch edge on that concrete to create a groove for that sealant to flow into. Pour that sealant in in a sufficient amount to seal that crack. The next step then is to apply the medium solids concrete sealant. A UCO product will work well like Res Seal. Spray that repair and then cover it with the Mr. Manhole poly cover disc which is going to slow down the hydration process and give you a high quality repair. All of your slumps and so forth are in the specification. Uh, the concrete mix designs are in there. Uh, every, all the material is very well spelled out in the specification. So you need to study this and understand it. Follow this repair method to the T and you'll get a repair that will last every time.